All right. So if you would, please open up your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24. We started this chapter last week, those of you who were with us, um, and the first few verses that we looked at last week were, well, they were pretty generalized verses, the things that Jesus had talked about, and yet some things are very specific at the same time. Um, in our first glance at this chapter last week, uh, Jesus spoke about being deceived in the last times. He spoke about false Christs, false prophets, and of course wars and uh, earthquakes and diseases and pestilence and uh, persecution and all of these things that you might be able to sit there this morning and say, well, you know, that stuff's been going on for 2,000 years. That stuff's been happening ever since this book was written. So what's so unique about these specific things? Well, I think one of the things that is unique about this when Jesus is speaking of it to us, he uses the analogy of a, a woman with child. And in that analogy, he tells us that, yes, these things will be happening on a regular basis. But as we draw closer to the end of the age, that these things would begin to happen more frequently. And they would begin to become more intensified as time would go by. Now, that's something we can look at from a past history. And we can say, yes, absolutely. There's been more earthquakes in the last year than uh, recorded in the last hundred years. I mean, there's thousands of movements going on in the planet. It, what I'm trying to say is these signs, these signs are uh, signs that anybody, whether you're a church person, a Christian, whatever, or even not, we should be able to recognize them as we are hopefully aware of our surroundings in the world. Now, I know that the second coming of Jesus with his church back to this earth is our blessed hope. That he is going to ra- rescue or rapture his bride, take us to be with him for that great tribulation period where we will not be on this planet, we will be in His presence. Because He has delivered us from the wrath to come. Very simple, easy logic to understand. So why is it so darn complicated? Why are there so many different views and arguments and so forth when you come to the topic of end times and prophecy? You know, passage in the New Testament says that in the end times, men will be saying, where is the promise of his coming? I mean, you know, we've been waiting 2,000 years. You you can easily say, where is the promise of his coming? Because it seems like everything is just continuing on the same. There's no hint of him coming. There's no, you know, is it ever going to happen? I think that people begin to give up after some time on this blessed hope that God has blessed us with. Never give up, you guys. Will Jesus come today? He might. Well, when I say will he come, will he call us today? He might. Will he call us in the next hundred years? He might. That's not the point here. This morning, the point is, as John tells us in the scripture, that we should live every single day of our lives in anticipation that he will come on this day. If you knew for a fact that at 2.30 this afternoon, that trumpet's going to blow, and the bride of Christ is going to be rescued, how would you be behaving between now and 2 o'clock? Oh, you'd probably be on your phone calling all your loved ones. You'd probably be repenting of all your sins. You'd probably be reading your Bible. You'd probably be trying to do all the things so that you wouldn't miss the bus at 2 o'clock, right? Well, John tells us that's how we should live all the time. 
That's the way we should live our lives. In the hope and in the anticipation that Jesus could come today. I know it's been being said for many, many years now. But I'll tell you, be honest with you, as time goes on, I got more and more fire in me knowing that it is going to happen. It is going to come to pass, without a doubt. Now, the people in Jesus' time, some, well, we look around and think maybe people in our culture are clueless. The people in Jesus' time were really clueless. They were hearing things that they had never really heard a man speak before. And there was confusion, and there were questions. So as we pick up our verses this morning, um, I want to read to you starting in verse 15, and we're going to go down to verse 29, see if we can get that all covered this morning. Verse 15 says, When you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place... Whoever reads this, let him understand. And then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such has not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ. Or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise, and they will show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. You see, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, do not go. Or look, he's in the inner room, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Lord, bless your word this morning, we pray. So this chapter, along with chapter 25 that we'll be studying also, is all about the return of Jesus and the end of the age. Now, it's obvious when we read these passages that they are written in a Jewish context. If we see some of the things that Jesus is mentioning here, it's easy for us to understand. He's talking to the Jews. And the reference to, for example, the holy place. That was in the temple in Jerusalem. That place where only the high priest could go once a year. He mentions that here. Obviously, he's talking about Jerusalem. It refers to the temple. Judea is mentioned by name, geographically. And this reference to the housetops, <laughs> that's totally Jewish. They spent a lot of time on their housetops, right? And then the reference to the Sabbath. You know, you're only able to travel a certain amount of distance, according to the Mosaic law, uh, on the Sabbath. And so he's being sensitive to the Jewish uh, doctrine, if you will, to tell them, well, just hope and pray that it doesn't come on the Sabbath so that you would be violating the Sabbath as you run for your lives. Now, here's part of the argument. A lot of people will look at this section and say, this is talking about what happened to Jerusalem in 70 A.D., when Titus came in with all the Roman soldiers and they sacked Jerusalem, we talked about it last week, they destroyed the temple, they burned it down, they tore every stone on top off of each other to get to the gold and the treasures that were there. A lot of folks will say this is talking about 
the fall of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. The fact that the holy place is mentioned and the existence of a temple in Jerusalem also tends for people to think that this might be talking about 70 A.D. But not all understand the scriptures in that way. My understanding of Scripture, and ours should be at Calvary Chapel, especially since we just went through Revelation this last year, we should know from our studies that there's going to be another temple built. There's no temple in Jerusalem. There hasn't been one there for 2,000 years, but there's going to be a temple there. That temple is going to be the result of a treaty that will be made by the Antichrist, to allow the Jews to rebuild their temple, to coexist next to the Muslim mosque, and to be able to go in and reinstate animal sacrifice. They've been waiting for this for 2,000 years. So it's really important when we look at this to try to get a picture of when is he speaking of? Is he speaking of A.D. 70, or is he speaking of a future event that has not yet taken place. Now, I want to read a passage to you from Luke chapter 21. This seems very similar to what I just read to you in Matthew 24, but there are some stark differences in these two that I want to point out. Most people who have this amillennial view or post-trib or the different types of views that there won't ever be a rapture, all of these different ideas that people have, they want to take what I'm going to read to you and marry it with what I just read to you. But we're going to find out there are two different discourses and they have two different meanings. Now listen, Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out, and let those in the country not enter the city. For this is the time of punishment and fulfillment of all that has been written. How dreadful will it be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. There'll be great distress in the land and wrath against this people. They will fall by the sword. And they will be taken as prisoners to all the nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now, when I read that, I can say with confidence he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Which it did happen, just like he said. And it was a punishment for the Jews. They lost their nation. They were scattered throughout the whole world for 2,000 years. They didn't have a homeland. They wandered. And they didn't win popularity contests wherever they went. They were usually hated, persecuted, because they were Jewish. And we know that Jesus is speaking specifically to the people who are listening to him right there at that moment. Because he said, this is a fulfillment of what's been written. And there's going to be great distress, and there is going to be famine, and there is going to be sword, and the Gentiles are going to trample all over your holy place. And that's going to continue to happen until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. So we see two different accounts going on here. I believe Jesus is covering both events. Now, it's interesting Um, throughout history, one of the things that I believe it was John wrote is that the spirit of Antichrist, speaking 2,000 years ago, is already at work. I'm not sure if that was John or Paul. I don't have the reference in front of me. But he acknowledges 2,000 years ago that the spirit of Antichrist was already at work 2,000 years ago. How do we see that? I think we see it in many, many different historical events that have taken place down through the millennium. We've seen it with what happened with the Caesars, how they presented themselves to be gods. And a lot of people will say, oh, that's the Antichrist. 
And then we saw it with another guy, Antichicus. I'm glad I'm not Greek. I'd have a hard time talking. Um, And I want to touch on that in just one minute. You had Hitler. There's a lot of people seeing what he was doing to the Jewish people. They were certain that that was the Antichrist. But you know, it's interesting to me that throughout history, when we have major prophecies like this, we see hints and shadows and almost what you might refer to as a precursor to that fulfillment. Hitler was not the fulfillment. Hitler was just a picture of what that fulfillment would look like in the future in some ways. The same with the Caesars. The same with so many other people who have had ideas to make themselves God, to control the whole world, to oppress people and be in charge and to rule by fear. Now, going back to Matthew 24, I think that the key to understanding what we're going to talk about here this morning truly is found in the very first verse that we read. In verse 15, it says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. And then there's a little parenthesis there you'll see in your Bible. Now, if you have a red letter edition, you'll notice that these next few words are in black. That's because they were inserted by Matthew. Matthew is telling his reader, you need to understand what Jesus is talking about in this verse. It's in parentheses. We need to know what is the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. And then... Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. A lot of people say they do not understand. And here Jesus takes us into the Old Testament, into the book of Daniel, and this is important that he uses this particular book. This book has been scrutinized, it's been digected, rejected, because they say it's a fraud. They say that Daniel was written hundreds of years after all the events that he talks about already occurred. That's why he knew with so much accuracy how to write it, because it was already done. And now they're trying to push that on you and me as a holy, anointed book written by God. Well, here's the thing. There's a lot of people that don't believe that Jonah got swallowed by a fish. There's a lot of people that don't believe that the Jews passed through the Red Sea. There's a lot of people who don't believe a lot of things. But you know what? When you see the Lord Jesus Christ validate these things, you can be certain it's true. He's the one that is using the references in the book of Daniel to explain to us this abomination of desolation. Some of you have studied that with us, and you know what I'm talking about. But let me just give you a few passages out of Dave, uh, Daniel. In Daniel 9.27, talking about this Antichrist, it says, He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. And in the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on a wing of the temple... He will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is declared is poured out on him. So here's this individual. He's going to be in the temple. He's going to confirm a covenant when it says for a seven, that speaks of seven-year period. And another way to look at that would say to be one week prophetically. A one seven-day week would be speaking of a seven-year period. So for one week or for seven years, he's going to make a covenant with the people of Israel. And what's that covenant going to be? To operate their temple again. To bring, finally, to bring peace. And you know, at the beginning of this one-week period or this seven-year period, a lot of people are going to be really excited because the things that we've been waiting to see for 2,000 years will apparently be coming together. There will be world peace. 
There will be an end to the conflict in the Middle East, which has been going on for 2,000 years. It's a family feud going on over there. And you know what? It's going to take a miracle to bring peace to that land. So here comes this he. We don't have his name. But here he comes. We know his number, don't we? 666, that's his number. And here he comes along. He makes a treaty halfway through the tribulation period. Three and a half years it lasts. From the beginning of the seven, when he first makes a treaty, to three, hundred, three and a half years later, they're going to be working in their temples. They're going to be doing animal sacrifices. They're going to be reverting back to all the Old Testament traditions that took place around the temple complex because it will be rebuilt at that time. That's part of the covenant, to allow them to rebuild. Now, if you've been to the Temple Mount, you'll see that there's a spot there that's empty, big, giant, huge slab, and nothing is set on it for 2,000 years. And they believe that that's where the old temple sat. In the book of Revelation, John talks a little bit about this event taking place. He tells him to measure the courts of the Jewish temple. And he tells John, I want you to build a wall around it. And these are the dimensions that I want you to put the wall because the outer court over here on this side, that's for the unclean. And he's speaking of the Muslims, the, the, the dome that's been there for so long. Some people think, well, they got to tear down the dome to build a temple. No, I don't believe that. I believe that the treaty will allow them to rebuild their temple while the dome still exists. But it will be separated by a wall. So nevertheless, it will be rebuilt and then three and a half years into this bliss that everybody will be so excited about, suddenly this man is going to put an end to the sacrifice, meaning animal sacrifices and offerings. He's going to stop the Jews from practicing their religion once again in the temple. And then he's going to set up an abomination, it says, on a wing of the temple. And then in Daniel 31, 11, 31, he says that his armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. And then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. With flattery, he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant. But the people who know their God will firmly resist him. They will be able to see that he is a liar, that he is a counterfeit, that he is Satan. He is the enemy. And then one more from Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. It says, from that time, from the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. So blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the 1,335 days. Pretty bizarre numbers there. You're probably going, what the heck is that all about, right? So there was this Syrian ruler, Antichius Epiphanes. He ruled about 400 years after Daniel made these prophecies. He was a great persecutor of the people of Israel. He hated God's people. And we find the story in the book of 1st and 2nd Maccabees. Now his desire was to stamp out the Jewish religion once and for all. My goodness, how many times have they tried to do that down over the millennia unsuccessfully? But he went in and he murdered and he sacked Jerusalem. And he murdered thousands of Jews, including women and children. And he went in and he desecrated the temple. And this desecration of the temple is what led to an event that we call the Maccabean Revolt, where the people said, that's enough, we're going to revolt against this. 
So according to 1 Maccabees, the abomination of desolation was actually set up. A, Greek, a statue of a Greek god was installed in the temple for a time. And for a time, the sacrifices of the Jews were stopped, and the temple was left empty and desolate. So we know that there is more to Daniel's prophecy than just this desolation by this ruler of Syria. Jesus refers to this as yet a future event in his day. Now, keep in mind, this, happened, this ruler happened 400 years after Daniel, which would have been in Jesus' past. But he's not referring to the past. He's referring to a future event. So it's not this guy that Jesus is talking about. And the various prophecies in Daniel include a lot of prophecies that had not taken place in A.D. 70. So the more we study, the more we look, the more we explore, the more we come to understand that we need a working knowledge of what the Scripture says in order to make an accurate interpretation of what he's trying to tell us. Again, in Daniel 9, um, he tells us how this guy is going to go in and he's going to stop the sacrifice and the offering and that he's going to set up abomination that causes desolation, which turns out to be a statue. Now, the man that Jesus is talking about, he will confirm this covenant for a seven-year period, which many look upon and say, well, this is when the Antichrist comes on the scene. He'll make a treaty. He'll break the treaty. And he'll stop the sacrifice in the Jewish temple. Now, one of the things that caused an abomination that caused desolation was that this ruler from Syria, 400 years after Daniel, he took a pig and he went into the temple and he sacrificed a pig on the altar. Now, do you know how Jewish people feel about pigs? It's bad. It's taboo. It's forbidden. It's a dirty animal. So let's all go home and have a pork sandwich, right? I like pork, actually. I'm kind of glad I'm not Jewish in that sense. But uh, he's going to, and that's how he's going to do this. He's going to sacrifice this pig, set up a statue, and for all intents and purposes, it's going to look a lot like what Jesus is talking about right here. Except for the fact that Jesus isn't saying that it happened a thousand years before, he's saying that it's yet to happen, it's yet to come. It's a future event. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 speaks of this time in our history. Paul is writing this to the church because the church had been receiving false doctrine, just like we do today. They were receiving teachers who were traveling teachers, and they would go around all the little churches, and they would try to infiltrate them with false doctrine. One of the things that they were talking about was, sorry, Jesus has already come. You missed him. You're left here. Too bad you missed the bus. And that was their message. And people were freaking out. I've lived all my life with the hopes that one day I'll hear that trumpet blow and the next moment I'll be in, 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 in heaven with the Lord, with you. And we'll all be looking at each other going, nice outfit, you know. It'll be great. That's what we're looking forward to. But even during the time of Paul, that spirit of Antichrist was at work. And so this is what he wrote to the church. He said, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we add, now catch those words, our being gathered to him, there's your rapture, we ask you, brothers, do not become easily unsettled or alarmed, by some prophecy or report or a letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God, or is worshipped, and he will set himself up in God's temple, proclaiming 
himself to be God. Now this ruler in Syria, he set up a Greek God. But the Antichrist will set himself up as God. And again, in the book of Revelation, John's referring to the same event when he writes this, speaking of the Antichrist. Because of the signs that he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. He ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. He was given power to breathe to the image in the beast so that it could speak and cause all who refused it to worship him would be killed. He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or his forehead so no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is in the name of the beast or the number of his name. This calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is man's number, 666. So Jesus gives future Jewish readers very important instructions. When you see this guy standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, you need to hit the road. If you're just getting off of work, don't run by the house to pick up a few things. Get out. If your kids are off school, you need to go get them and take off. You need to run for your lives. He's talking to the Jewish people here. Because this is exactly what will happen. Stop and think about it. He is writing to the Jews. And, and by and large, he's addressing the Jewish people. You know, the Gospel of Matthew is a Jewish book. It was written by Matthew, who was a Jew, to show through the Old Testament scriptures that Jesus truly was the Messiah. He goes on to say concerning this event, he says, let those who are in Judea run. If you're on your roof, don't take anything out of the house, Run. If you're in the field, don't go back for a coat. Run. And how is it going to be for women who are pregnant during those times? Rough. You women could imagine trying to take care of a baby or being real close to having a baby and you're on the run for your life. He goes on to say in verse 21 of Matthew, he says, there's going to be great distress. Now here we begin to separate Luke's account of 70 A.D. with this future account that Jesus is speaking of here. He says there's going to be great distress unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. We're looking at a future event here, something that has not taken place as yet. But look at what Jesus is using the words to describe this time. He's not just talking about Jerusalem falling. He's talking about a time of tribulation that the world has never seen in the history of the world. And nor will it ever be seen like that again. Now you know and I know and we've known for a long time. We have enough destructive weapons to destroy this whole planet many times over, very easily. And that's kind of the underlying fear that people kind of live with. Who's got their finger on the button? That's kind of scary, isn't it? But we have the capacity to do that. Now, never before in history have we had the capacity to destroy the whole world like we have today. Jesus said things were going to get so bad that the whole world would be destroyed, except he's going to come and put an end to it before that happens. He says, if those days would not have been cut short, no one would survive. 
But for the sake of the elect, that's you, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. Tribulation period lasts around seven years. And Daniel talks about these. Uh, now here's where we get into some more curious numbers. Seventy-sevens of years. I know your brains are going, what? Seventy-sevens of years. That's 490 years, by the way. Seventy weeks of seven years. 490. Now, since the time of Daniel, there have been um, 69 of those sevens fulfilled. And then the fulfillment of the prophecies came to an end when Christ came on the scene. And so now there's still left this one last seven-year period that Daniel spoke of that has not been fulfilled. That's what we're talking about when we speak of the tribulation period, that seven years that Daniel talked about. Very clear, not too hard to understand what he's saying to us here. One way or another, this conflict between the Arabs and the Jews will be brought to a agreement. Now, I am of the opinion, and I think most of you are, and I know for sure that Calvary Chapel's opinion on this is that the Lord will come for the church or his bride before this happens. That you and I will never ever see the Antichrist. As a matter of fact, Paul reinforces that when he talks about the idea that this spirit of Antichrist, which has been demonstrated throughout history all these years, culminating to today, that this spirit of Antichrist is being held back from totally fulfilling his mission. And what does the scripture say is holding him back? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is restraining him from fully exposing himself in history right now. And why is that? It's to protect us. It's to protect the church. If you go back in the Gospel of John and when Jesus starts giving the promise of the Holy Spirit coming, he tells them why the Holy Spirit's going to come. He's going to draw you to God. He's going to feed you spiritually. He's going to bless you. He's going to teach you. These are going to be all of his missions, if you will, on our behalf. His job, the Holy Spirit's job, is to protect the bride. That's you and me. Then, Paul goes on to say that when the Holy Spirit is removed, then that wicked one will be revealed. That restraining force will no longer be on the earth. Then the Antichrist can come out full-blown. But you see, the church and the bride, which is the church, and the Holy Spirit were partners. Where the Holy Spirit goes, we go. And if the Holy Spirit leaves the planet, that means we leave the planet. It's a rescue. It's the Holy Spirit protecting the bride of Jesus to keep us safe. During this time in which Jesus said that the whole world is going to be deceived. The church won't be here. The whole world is going to be deceived by the Antichrist. See, these are some of the differences that we need to look at in order to come to a logical conclusion about what the Scripture is trying to teach us here. One of the things that's going to happen, and we begin to, you know, we begin to see that happening now. He says, look, people are going to be saying, oh, look over there, there's Jesus. Oh, oh no, there he is over there, go to that place. He says, don't believe it. Because false Christs and false prophets are going to appear. And here's what they're going to do. The Antichrist is going to be really good at this too. He's going to be able to do miracles. We call them counterfeit miracles. Because they don't come from the power of God. They come from the power of our adversary. 
But it says these false prophets will appear and they will perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if it were possible. And he goes on to say, see, I am telling you ahead of time. He's warning them ahead of time. Anybody ever come up to you and say, look, I'm telling you ahead of time, if you don't deal with this, you're going to have a problem. And then we go, and sure enough, if we don't deal with it ahead of time, it becomes a big deal, doesn't it? He's warning us here. Pay attention to what's going on around you. He's telling his disciples and he's telling us, he's saying, look, right before I come back, there's going to be an increase of false prophets and false messiahs to set the stage for the Antichrist who will come on the scene at the end of the age. A lot of information here, huh? We could probably go on and on and on here today with this, but we're running out of time. We can always touch on it again next time we get together. This tribulation period, it's going to be absolutely horrible. And I want you to know that if you're here this morning and you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you need to know this. This is the fact, okay? This is logic. This is our hope. We will not go through the wrath of God. Listen to that. You're not ever, as a believer, going to experience the wrath of God. How do I know that? Well, I know it because Jesus hung on that cross, and he took the wrath of God that I deserved upon himself. And when we put our faith and trust in what he did for us on the cross, he took our wrath that we deserved. Now, if we're here midway through the tribulation and all these things are happening to us and God's wrath is being poured out upon us, I'm going to have to say, what did Jesus do? What did he accomplish? I thought that's why he came, to take my place. We won't be here when the wrath of God. Now, I'm not talking about, don't get me wrong, tough times, tribulation, persecution, rejection, disease, death, cancer, all of those things we are not immune to. All of those things we deal with even as the bride of Christ. But when it comes to God pouring out his wrath on an ungodly world, that's not you. And you might be thinking, well, I haven't been the greatest Christian, you know, I haven't really done a good job. Well, you know what? We're here today. Today's the day that you can say, you know what? I do need to get squared up. Because he could come tomorrow or today or tonight. You know, Jesus talked about it in another passage where he said, there's a man and wife and they're asleep in bed. And she hears a noise and turns her head. He's gone. And then Jesus said, I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time after that to wonder why, because the sun has come, and you've been left behind. How will we be left behind? Because we do not know him. You read here with me this morning how all of these false prophets are able to come in and do all these miracles and claim that they're the messiahs. And Jesus said, you know, in that day, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to come to me. And they're going to say, say, Jesus, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we do healings in your name? Didn't we do great miracles in your name? And we all read that and we get a little bit confused about that. But these are the false prophets that Jesus is speaking of. And how will he respond to them? He's going to say, I don't know you. As a matter of fact, I never knew you. As a matter of fact, you're not part of my bride. So off you go, right, into the fire. This morning you may have issues with people. You've been hurt. You've been disappointed. You've been lied to, maybe even in a church. But I want you to know that people who do that kind of thing, 
they're going to be held accountable. God will hold them accountable. God does not forget. We may be thinking, oh, man, all these things just go on, and nothing seems to be getting better. It's just getting worse. Well, the world's getting worse. That doesn't mean we need to. We grow. While they go, go down, we go up. That's the difference between the bride and the world. And yes, those who have misrepresented him, those who have lied in his name, they will be among those who will be cast into everlasting punishment. The best way to avoid being deceived by these things is to know the truth. And if you know the truth well enough, when that lie comes across your table, you'll be able to spot it immediately. I used to have a gal that came here, and she was a bank teller, and she used to tell me that uh, when she was being trained how to, you know, look at a dollar bill or a hundred dollar bill or whatever to determine whether it was authentic, and this was before they had the strips and all, but they would bring out all the different types of counterfeit thinking will teach them about counterfeit bills then they'll be able to see them as they come across that's not how they did it they took the real thing they took the genuine document they took the hundred dollar bill and they studied every nook and cranny of it and so when she's standing there and she sees that counterfeit come across she knows so well what the real thing looks like, that she can spot it. This is what we do with God's Word. We learn to know God's Word so well that when that lie crosses your table, when you hear that on the radio, when you send away for material and it comes and you're thinking, this isn't what I've been taught. By knowing God's Word, we'll be able to spot that. We'll be able to reject it. And even, perhaps, be able to stand up for some truth. Amen? So if you're here this morning, and maybe you're a little on the edge, on the fringe, maybe. You're not too sure if you're part of the bride or if you're part of the world. And you want to be part of the bride. And maybe your heart's crying out, saying, I want to be part of the bride. How can I? Well, the Bible's real simple. Whoever confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead will be saved. Do you believe that this morning? And if you're struggling with that and if you need prayer, I would really encourage you this morning before you leave to meet with Lonnie and Chris. And let them pray with you, whatever your burden might be, it doesn't matter. You know, when you go to the doctors, you expect certain things to happen. (laughs) These days, not much happens, but we expect it. But when you come to church, I think we come with expectations also. Every time I come here to church, I have expectations that some of you, one of you, are going to say, man, i got to quit playing games. I need to get my heart right with the Lord because He could come at any moment. What if, oh, maybe the pastor's wrong. Maybe it's just his view. Maybe he doesn't know what he, ah, but what if the pastor's right? I'd rather be known for taking the steps but might be right than ignoring it. I want to encourage you in that area this morning. God loves you. He wants to forgive us of our sin. He wants to have fellowship with us. He wants to be our father. Let's pray. Lord, oh, thank you for this time. These are crazy times, Lord, that we're living in. And we know that we have a lot of questions, a lot of uncertainties. Lord, I think sometimes we tend to stare at the small things and miss the main thing. We tend to worry about the economy and social justice and really things in the big picture that really aren't that important. The important thing is you, Jesus. 
and the things that you taught us and the things that are headed our way. Lord, help us to be strong. Help us to be a light. Fill us, Holy Spirit, with your power. Let us be bold, unafraid, and trust you with all of our hearts. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.